Football Podcast. Touchdown Rams! Recovered by the Chargers. Touchdown UCLA! With USC great and NFL stud, Frosty Rucker. The Trojans back in front. And LAFB founder, Ryan Zyrood. On the Believe Podcast Network and LAFBnetwork.com. This is your destination for Los Angeles football. What's going on, Los Angeles, and welcome into another episode of the LA Football Show live right now, five o'clock on a Friday on AM, the Mightier 1090. Thrilled to have you with us. Uh, you can always find us on the LA Football Network and the Believe Podcast Network. Been rec- recording throughout the week on LA Football Network, but for those listening on radio, hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving. Um, you know, obviously we had the show the day after the Thanksgiving, but now we're the week after. It's kind of Thanksgiving is like that whole weekend, it feels like, which is great, which is why it's one of the best holidays out there. So hope you're able to enjoy it uh, with friends and family and uh, now get back into it as we're in the full holiday season. You know, Hanukkah starting, uh, Christmas coming up, which is my favorite holiday of all of them. As you can see, if you're watching video on YouTube, got the Christmas tree in the background, little Rams and Chargers decorations on there for LA football teams, but uh, yeah, my favorite time of year. I know some people are bah humbug this time of year, not me. It's my favorite. I'm already about 20 Christmas movies deep. So hit me up on Twitter at Ryan Darrett LAFB, or you can comment below uh, if you're on YouTube, uh, which is at LAFB Network, if you want to check us out. What's your favorite Christmas movie? I'm going to talk about this all month long. So I'm a huge Christmas movie buff. I'll reveal... My top five, let's say the episode, the week of Christmas. So I'll leave a cliffhanger there. As you know, I'm 20 deep in already. Watched some of the new ones on Netflix already. A couple good ones that came out. Um, But I'll reveal my top five the week of Christmas. But let me know. Comment below your favorite Christmas movies. We'd love to hear it. I'm a huge Christmas movie buff. Got a great show for you today, though. College football regular season is done. But we still have amazing stuff going on with our teams. You got UCLA going bowling. We got some uh, projections about where they will play and who they will play. So I'm going to talk about that before the bottom of the hour. We got USC, or excuse me, at the end of the show, at the bottom of the second hour. We'll, we'll get into that. Uh, USC, obviously their season's over. Well, technically it's not. They play Cal this week, and I'm not really going to preview that game because it's kind of a throwaway game. Everyone's just looking to next year. They do play Cal after it was a makeup game because uh, the game postponed due to COVID uh, with Cal having, you know, too many players out uh, in COVID protocol. So they will actually play this Saturday up in Berkeley, but we're not gonna do much previewing of that. Cause I don't think really anyone cares. The big news is Lincoln Riley coming to town, big recruits already flipping. We're going to get into that at the bottom of the hour. Rams need a big rebound which we're going to start the show with here against Jacksonville at home at SoFi. Let me know if you're going to be at the game. Hopefully uh, some of us that will be there can link up with you. And the Chargers that we'll talk about after the bottom of the hour. Travel to Cincinnati, our very own Dan Wolkenstein, Chargers Unleashed podcast right here on the LA Football Network, will be there in Cincy to watch the matchup of Joe Burrow and Justin Herbert. It's going to be a good one. So we'll get into that too. Uh, today's show of the LA football show brought to you by our friends at my bookie. If you're a better out there or you just want to dabble, test it out, win some extra money. You know, you can do parlays on actual games. You can do player props. So, you know, I, I've gotten more into, I used to like parlay like 10 games, put five bucks on it. See if I could win like 2000 because of the odds are so crazy. It's impossible. One team always ruins it for you. Usually more. But I found that you can do some good money if you get in these player props. So, like, for instance, take a Rams game. You can look at what the odds are. Say Cooper Cup plus 83 yards on the game. Matthew Stafford plus 289 yards on the game. And you can parlay all those, and a lot of those are more likely to happen. Put some money on it. So go to my bookie. Use our promo code LAFB. Got to use it to double your deposit. Free money. Don't throw away free money. Double your deposit with the promo code LAFB at my bookie. All right. Rams. This is a, a a big game, and it's not necessarily an exciting game because it's the the two win Jaguars coming to town. You know, Trevor Lawrence, number one overall pick. So I, I think some people will be excited to kind of see him in live action if you're going to SoFi. But this is an absolute must win. I called last week against the Packers a must win, in my opinion, because it, it didn't decide the season. 
it wasn't going to decide whether or not the Rams made the playoffs or even whether or not they could win the division. I think there's still enough games left, even though now they're two back of Arizona. They still play them once. They still play Seattle once. They still play the Niners once. They can still climb back in and end up winning that division. Obviously, it's out of their hands now, but they can still do it. But I called it a must-win game because it would really show us who this Rams team is. And at this point, this is not a Super Bowl team. Not even close to a Super Bowl team. They're too soft up front. They don't control the line of scrimmage. Matthew Stafford has three straight games of three pick sixes. That's more. That's the same as Aaron Rodgers has had his entire career, which is a crazy stat that I just learned. They don't establish the run. They're too inconsistent on offense altogether. The defense is not nearly as bad as people say, but it, it's not great. It's not a Super Bowl defense. They give up big plays at the inopportune times. They can't stop the run when necessary. They give up too many third down conversions. So I said it was a must-win game because it's like, okay, you had two big losses to the Niners and Titans in back-to-back weeks. You got the bye week now to get guys healthy, put everything in to this Packers game at Lambeau. And, you know, the score was actually not that that much of a blowout, but the Packers controlled the game from, from whistle to whistle. And so at this point, it's very telling, unfortunately, of what this Rams team is. Now, I'm an optimist, many of you know, to listen to the show. And so I'm very confident this team can get back on track. And there's no better team to get back on track against than this Jaguars team. Um, you know, Urban Meyer, phenomenal college coach. He could still, I mean, if, he, if, if they see this through and the Jaguars retain him with all the off-the-field stuff with the only two wins thus far, but it, they're in like full rebuilds. So you can't really fault the wins solely on him. He can maybe change the narrative that he can be a good NFL coach, give him some time. At this point, though, it's, you know, I think everyone's got to be very, very happy if you're a Chargers fan out there that you hired Brandon Staley and not Urban Meyer, like many people were pining for because they wanted a big name coming here to L.A. But it's just not a very good football team. They, they, they don't have, similar to like the Lions, they just don't have the horses right now. So, I mean, they're scrapping, they're playing hard. You know, they have some good pieces. Obviously, Trevor Lawrence, who's had an up and down year. Not nearly the years that Joe Burrow and Justin Herbert had last year. I think everyone proclaimed Trevor Lawrence as, you know, the next coming of Andrew Luck, the next coming of John Elway, some of these great, great quarterbacks. And I wouldn't say I've seen that at all in the, in the short amount of film that I've watched on him thus far. Definitely has talent. We know what he did in college. Can definitely be great. You know, you need help still at quarterback position. But at this point, he's not elevating his team to a level that I think people thought he would. And that's why I hate rookie rankings. You know, I'm probably getting off topic here, but you see all these rookie rankings of having rookies that have yet to play a snap getting ranked higher than pro quarterbacks that have played five, six, seven years in the league. Like, I think it's, I think every rookie quarterback coming into the season should be ranked last. And you can rank them how you want. But if there's three starting rookies, you go 20, 30, 31, 32. Because they haven't played it down yet. The fact that there was, there was actual rankings out there. Actual rankings out there. That had Zach Wilson rated higher than Kirk Cousins, Teddy Bridgewater. Like some of these quarterbacks that have played a lot of years. And yeah, they're not like world beaters. But they've proven they can at least play in the game. Zach Wilson hasn't proven yet. Not saying he can't. Trevor Lawrence, I think, has proven he belongs, but he hasn't by any means been a top flight QB. And so the Rams need to absolutely take advantage of this and show that this defense can stifle this Jags offense. Like I said, they have a few pieces, you know, Marvin Jones, um, but they're banged up. You know, they have injuries across all their skill positions. So this defense really, I think, needs to come and show out. Uh, and you look at their offense just, just based on last week just based on last week, where they played Atlanta. No, they're not a very good team. Guess who, Rams fans are going to love to hear this, guess who the highest graded player, not just on offense, but player was, oh no, excuse me, it is on offense, but I think it's overall too, on the Jags team was. Granted, didn't have a ton of snaps. You know, he's not an offensive lineman who had 70 plus snaps. He only had like 13. 
But Tavon Austin, who will be returning, not returning to SoFi, but returning to play his former team who drafted him in the first round, the Rams, was the highest graded Jaguars player last week with a 90.2 overall grade, according to Pro Football Focus. So <laughs> I figured there'd be some uh, Rams fans. They would love that, and they'd be very surprising. Um, but yeah, you know, they have talent. They have LaVisca Chenault, who I think is a, is a very talented player. If they use him correctly, I don't think they've been using him in the right manner, in my opinion. Uh, here's a guy that was used as a gadget player at Colorado. Kind of a, a do-it-all, kind of like a Tavon Austin. Bigger size, bigger speed, or, you know, similar speed, but bigger size. But they're kind of using him more as like a split-out receiver, which he needs to be more gadgety. And I think they're starting to try that out more. And so that's something to watch for if you're the Rams or the Rams defense, is a guy like LaVishka. Because Marvin Jones, we know what he can do. He's your outside threat, your deep ball, jump ball guy. Talented guy. Um, has had up and down games, I say, this year. LaVishka is a guy that I don't, I don't think a ton know what is going to happen because are they going to use him in that gadget role or are they going to split him out and just have him run traditional wide receiver routes? If they use him as a gadget, this is a guy that can tear this Rams defense apart. Just because the Rams... Outside of Jalen Ramsey, right now, you know, last year, some of the Darius Williams, Jordan Forsman, these guys are playing a lot better. But as of right now, Jalen Ramsey is the only guy that can really lock down a player. And even last week, he was on Devontae Adams for the most of the game, and Devontae still had a pretty good game. And that's going to happen. That's not saying Jalen Ramsey had a terrible game. If you watch the game, Aaron Rodgers, Devontae, it's just a touch matchup. Sometimes it's there's no defense for a perfect ball, as as many will say. But that's where LaVishka can pose a threat because if you want, again, this is not a strong offense, but they do have weapons. And if you want Jalen to shut down LaVishka, who's, you know, a second-year player, hasn't proven a whole lot yet, but like I said, has those intangibles, well, then you're asking for Marvin Jones to be able to stretch the field on the outside. And so you got to have confidence that either Darius Williams, who is probably seven inches shorter than him, or that a safety over the top can contain that. Or that your pass rush just gets home, which we haven't seen the last three weeks. Or we did see it against Tennessee some, but we definitely didn't see it against the Niners or the Packers. If the pass rush gets home, that blows everything up. It makes the job a lot easier for the secondary when guys like Von Miller and Aaron Donald in the backfield within two seconds. So that'll be interesting, though, to see how Jalen's used this week. And that's been a point of contention among all Rams fans because sometimes we want him in that star role. Because he can go all over, you kind of pick your poison. Like, okay, on this play, on this setup, he's going to be on LaVishka. On this play, on this setup, he's on Marvin. On this play, on this setup, he's actually guarding the back, out of the backfield. James Robinson, who can be lethal. Or are they going to say, you're shadowing this guy all game? I don't think with this team, he'll be shadowing. I mean, as good as LaVishka can be, as good as Marvin Jones can be, they're not Devontae Adams. They're not DK Metcalf. So I think he'll be back in that kind of star role, moving over. We won't see Troy Reader having to guard guys in space, even though tip, most of those plays were zones. He obviously didn't read the zone correctly. <laughs> and everyone's hating on Troy for that. Let me let me just talk about that for a second. Three specifically I can think of big plays over the middle to either A.J. Dillon or there's a play on with Devontae Adams. Most of them were zone plays, so it's not like Troy Reader was man on man. But regardless... You can hate on Troy Reed all you want, want him off the team. That's not what he's good at. Like, you can't ask a guy to do what he's not good at and expect good results. Troy Reader is a solid tackler. He's good close to the line of scrimmage. He's had, He can rush. He, I know he doesn't have great rushing stats, but he can rush the quarterback on certain blitz packages. He had a three-sack game last year. You can't ask him all of a sudden, like, hey, we need you to cover a speed back or cover the best receiver in the NFL if he's doing a you know, flats over the middle. It's like asking an accountant to all of a sudden be like a content creator. It's not going to go well. <laughs> it's not going to go well. So everyone that's hating on Troy, that is where there deserves to be some hate on Raheem Morris. And I haven't been on critical on him as many have because I just don't think it's deserved. I really don't. I mean, he's it's still a top probably 15 defense top 10 in a lot of categories, they're actually still to this day the number one rated defense according to Pro Football Focus overall. So I know those are subjective stats and we can watch the game and get frustrated. Sometimes it's execution though. 
And it, but and even still, even with the execution, they're still a graded number one defense. So <laughs> you need to pump the brakes a little bit on that. But this is a game the Rams should not just win, but dominate. And they need to dominate because they need to show the world, the NFL, that they are a contender. Because after the last three weeks, they went from top contender to bad moves by Les Snead. People want Les out all of a sudden, even though everyone's praising him, you know, three weeks ago. And now everyone, a lot of people want him out. Sean McVay, top five coach. Now people want him out. Can't adjust. Doesn't stick to the run. These are all valid critiques, but this is a seven and four football team. And yes, they have not beaten good teams other than the Buccaneers. The Buck stops with Sean McVay and Les Snead. Some of that on Matthew Stafford also as a vet and a captain. But we're not at the point where this thing is a, a throwaway season and a, a blow the thing up. Now, if they lose to the Jags on Sunday, we're getting maybe closer to that. I still... I, I, I think they could lose out this year and you're still not seeing Snead or McVay touched. I mean, they've done too much good things, but that's not going to happen. Let's, I'm going to put it out there. There is 0% chance that happens. The Rams are going to the playoffs. The Los Angeles Rams will be in the playoffs. Now, will they win a playoff game? That's where a game like this can show us some improvement. Troy Aikman was talking on a radio show this week about super teams. And about if super teams can win in the NFL, meaning a Super Bowl. And he says, no, I don't think so. Well, the Rams by many are considered a super team because of what they've done to get key players, giving up, like not building really through the draft. They add depth to the draft. They build through free agency and trades, getting star players that are proven commodities. They added Matthew Stafford this offseason, added Von Miller, added Odell Beckham Jr. They're 0-3 since adding Von Miller and Odell Beckham Jr. Now, there's a lot of things that uh, that contributes to, and I do believe they can win with those guys, but they have to go out and prove it. So I think Vaughn hopefully has a good game this week. I think Vaughn is ready to have a breakout game with the Rams. It, it took some time to get the ankle fully healthy, get into it. Odell Beckham Jr. I think would have benefited a lot more if Robert Woods didn't get hurt. Unfortunately, now he had to pick up more slack, had to learn the playbook a little quicker, but I think as they adjust and make him in that Robert Woods role, He'll be more successful also. So let's not freak out. Let's see the Rams go out and play a good game against the Jaguars. So before we head to commercial, though, I do want to touch on USC. I talked about it extensively in the last podcast episode. You can check that out at the LA Football Network um, or anywhere you listen to podcasts. But I do want to mention some key recruits already that have flipped. This is a, It's an exciting time to be a Trojans fan. Exciting time if you're a Trojans fan because after the years of mediocrity, basically after Pete Carroll, you know, you had, you had some good slivers in there. Clay Helton did win a Rose Bowl with Sam Darnold one year. Um, you know, Lane Kiffin was kind of an exciting coach, but then he got fired on the tarmac. You had the uh, internship of uh, Ed O, and that was fun. But overall, it's been a failed couple, you know, close to two decades since Pete left. In less than a week since Riley has been announced the head coach, you have two five stars that have flipped and now committed to USC. Granted, these were five stars recruited by Lincoln Riley to Oklahoma. So it makes a lot of sense. The guy recruited and they want to follow. And it happens to be the school in their own backyard that has a lot of history, which happened before they were even born. <laughs> so I'm sure they don't really know anything about the history, but I'm sure they've heard about it. But Malachi Nelson, QB, five star QB from Los Sal in 2023. So still has another year of high school flipped and will now be coming to USC. It'll be like the first true dual threat QB USC's had in since Rodney Pete. Probably. I and mean, that's just not who they recruit. They usually go after your prototypical pocket passers. Now Kynelson can do it all. Also high school right by Long Beach, California. Beautiful, beautiful school, beautiful city. I grew I not grew up, but I, you know, went to college in Long Beach and, and was right by it. So it's cool seeing that high school really be successful. And then Relique Brown Another modern-day product. You know, they just pump out five stars. Phenomenal running back from modern day that now has flipped from Oklahoma as well to come to USC. So in less than a week, USC's recruiting class has gone from like eight or nine to two. And that's just from two flips. We're going to see a lot more. There's other guys that 
decommitted the USC. They're now considering recommitting. And then we'll obviously get into National Signing Day next year in February. It's an exciting time. And getting Lincoln Riley here in LA is great for USC, is great for the Trojan brand, and is fantastic for Los Angeles football as a whole. Couldn't be more thrilled. Let's take a quick break, though. We'll be right back with some Chargers and uh, Bengals talk and end with some UCLA bowling. Welcome back to the LA Football Show. I'm your host, Ryan Dyrud. And with the holidays, I wouldn't even say around the corner. We're basically in them already. I want you to say goodbye to Dole Gifts. Lightbox lab-grown diamonds are the brightest gifts of the year. Using cutting-edge technology and innovative techniques, they've cracked the science of sparkle. Reminds me of uh, How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days. Frost yourself. Creating the highest quality lab-grown diamonds you can find at a light price of 800 per carat. Crazy cheap. I don't know how many of you guys are married out there. I am. I bought a real diamond for my wife. It was not 800 bucks a carat. I can tell you that much. They have the same chemical makeup of natural diamonds, but are just grown in a lab. Because of their process, they can create stones in blush pink and beautiful blue, as well as classic light or white, excuse me, light box lab grown. Diamonds are the gift they'll never want to take off priced so they won't have to. They really do make any outfit sparkle. Frost yourself. Visit lightboxjewelry.com to add sparkle to your holiday shopping. That's lightboxjewelry.com. Lightbox diamonds. Never a dull moment. All right, let's get into this Chargers game. This is going to be a great game. I mean, not only is it Burrow and Herbert going head-to-head, which is exciting because last year, remember, Herbert wasn't playing. It was the first game of the year, and Tyrod Taylor was the starter for the Chargers. So you have Herbert versus Burrow for the first time. But you also have two good football teams. I mean, the Bengals just decimated the Pittsburgh Steelers. And they're not a top. Baltimore's still a top of the division, but they're definitely a playoff team right now. But like the Chargers, <laughs> they've also been a very up-and-down team. They've had some weeks where you're like, man, this team looks absolutely fantastic. This is a, a true playoff contender. And then other weeks where they get blown out and you, you're left scratching your head and saying, is this the real Bengals team? And, and honestly, that's been the NFL in general. I mean, who is a real true team that we've seen that is dominant week in, week out, or at least like realistically, we know what they are. Like, yeah, they, we have no undefeated teams left, but they're not like losing to bad teams. I would say, honestly, as weird as it is to say, the Cardinals might be the only one that fits that description. And that's just the wild season that it's been so far in the NFL. But the Bengals overall are, are a good football team. They have what you need basically at every level. Their offensive line is definitely their weakest point, but it hasn't cost them as much as I think many people did. But they have, you know, a future star in Joe Burrow. They have a phenomenal receiving core. I talk every week. It's like, who is the top receiving core? I'd say the Rams are up there, except... Without trees, I think they drop definitely without Robert Woods. Cardinals got to be up there, but DeAndre Hopkins has been, you know, hurt quite a bit this season. You could argue the Seahawks, maybe. Broncos have a good young core, but they haven't, they don't have the production yet. Bengals are pretty damn good. You know, you got Jamar Chase, you got Tyler Boyd, you got T. Higgins. And they're, they're, <laughs> that's a pretty solid core that um, Joe Burrow's throwing to. And Jamar Chase might end up breaking, you know, records and having a bet. He might end up having a better season than what we saw Justin Jefferson have last season, which I didn't bring up them. Justin Jefferson, Adam Thielen, also great receiving core. Those LSU receivers, man, pretty special. Pretty special. Excited to see Drake London though next year, USC product. You know, represent, represent LA. Um, so that being said, we'll start with the defense again and we'll get to the offense. Defense of the Chargers, that is. They are going to have their hands full. And this this defense, what's been frustrating, and a lot of fans have, are really frustrated. And, you know, I caution everyone to, you know, pause and not just immediately say, wow, we hired this defensive-minded coach, and our weakness is our defense. We can't stop the run. We can't stop the pass. Those are true. But you got to look at it as, A, he had one offseason, Staley that is, to get the personnel that he thought fit his scheme. And 
and then one off season to teach the incumbent players basically changing 180. You're going from a 4-3 scheme to a 3-4. Again, that's that's doesn't mean much in today's NFL because those base packages are used so rarely. But you're going from a very different cover 3-4-3 three, three scheme that Gus Bradley ran to a two high shell 3-4 base that has a lot of different looks with stars and monies and you know different rotations of guys, different gap discipline, different gap uh scheme and projections. So it, it is a lot. You know, we talked to players in the, in training camp and they were like, yeah, this is like, I'm going back to school. I'm not having to reteach myself a lot. And some people will criticize that and say, well, good coach should, you know, just coach players based on their ability and put them in a situation to win. And yes, I agree with that, but this scheme has proven to win. <laughs> so it's one thing if it, it, it doesn't work over a long period of time, but 12 weeks in is not a long period of time. And this scheme has proven to work. Vic Fangio has made an entire career on it as being one of the greatest defensive masterminds he'll go down in history with this scheme. Brandon Staley, who's adopted it, added his own wrinkles, had the best defense in the NFL last year with the Rams. And then now it's about adjustments. They haven't had, you know, continuity on the defensive line because they've had injuries there, guys missing time with COVID. They haven't got as much pass rush as they should from the talent they have. Between Joey Bosa, Chenna Nwosu, Kyler Frackrell. And then their secondary has been banged up. They haven't had the the egregious injuries that we've known from these Chargers teams. Knock on wood. You know, we haven't seen like a Derwin James or a or Herbert or Keenan Allen go down with injury. Thank God. But they haven't had a consistent back end throughout the year. There's always like a one piece missing. Because if you just look at your starters across the board, you know, if Mike Davis, Sante Samuel Jr., Chris Harris in the slot, your back end is going to be Nasser Adderley and Derwin James. Those are your kind of nickel five, right? I mean, it is rare that those five guys have been on the field together. Chris Harris missed time in the beginning of the year. Mike Davis has been banged up. Nasser Adderley seems like he misses every other game. Now with Sante Samuel Jr., he had a concussion early in the year. Now he has a second concussion, so he'll be out for an extended period of time. So you're throwing in Tavon Campbell as a, a starter. You know, there was one week he was CB2. Then Asante Samuel goes down, he becomes CB1. Trying to guard Justin Jefferson. It's not going to go well. Mike Davis comes back, Asante Samuel Jr. is out. So he's CB2 again. Nasir Adderley goes out. You have Alohi Gilman having to play as safety number two. Well, then Alohi Gilman gets hurt. Mark Webb, who they drafted this year, he's been hurt for a long time now. So the biggest thing that I want fans to think about before we kind of get more into this game is yes, the defense has not been good. Yes, it has been their weakest unit. Yes, they do need to fix things and adjust things. But as a voice of reason, when you don't have constant continuity with your starters and you're constantly having to plug in different guys, you're never going to be as good as you should be. Now, we can get into this depth and talk about that being an issue. But again, one off season is not a lot of time to truly build up your roster and construct it exactly what works best for you. Because remember, Staley went from being a linebacker coach to a D coordinator to now in charge of an entire roster. When he was the Rams DC, he wasn't constructing a roster. Sean McVay and Leslie made a came to him like, hey, is there any additions you'd like to see us go after on defense? And he'd throw out a few names. Now he can't just think about defense. He's got to think about the offense, the special teams. He had to build an entire coaching staff. Now, I know everyone will say, well, yeah, that's why he got hired. You're, you're supposed to do that. Again, if we're in year three and these are still issues, then yes, now we need to really, really dig deep about what's the issue. 12 games in, first time head coach, let's cut some slack there. Now, that being said, how can we improve on a week to week basis, especially going up against a team now that is playing very good football? Is a their coach and Zach Taylor a Sean McVay? whatever you want to call it, prodigy off his tree is going to run a similar offensive scheme, which Brandon Silly should know pretty well. So that could be a benefit in this game, but they also have a great running attack and Joe Mixon chargers still ranked dead last in, in, you know, rushing defense. It has gotten better. They're last still because of how bad they were the first few weeks. If you, cause usually when you rank 
when you rank units just based on when someone, when you're listening to a podcast or a show and they're not going to like DVA or DVOA or EPA or any of those stats, they're just saying like the third ranked defense. That's usually based on yards per game. That's how that, just so you know, that's how that stat comes out. So if you're watching ESPN and you're watching NFL Live, they're like, yeah, this is the third ranked offense. That's based on their yards per game. So when they say the last ranked rush defense, it means the Chargers give up the most rushing yards per game. But the last few weeks, they've actually gotten a lot, lot better. And if you combine those three to four weeks, Denver was a little rough, but even yardage was not crazy high. Then they're actually more middle of the road. But because the first few weeks were so bad, that still averages out to the most. So anyway, just want to make that little caveat. This defensive line, if they're able to get some guys back, you know, I I haven't heard for sure on the injury report if Linville Joseph will be a go, but getting him back would be huge. Jerry Tillery has still been a, a letdown for this defensive line unit. He needs to play to his potential. I mean, this this has to be, and I've seen a lot of stuff on Twitter with with the guys behind him. You know, Braden Fioco, uh, you know, Covington's one of those guys, Forrest Merrill, guys that, you know, have been on the practice squad. We saw them play actually against Minnesota because of injuries and played pretty dang well. You know, the Chargers were able to contain Dalvin Cook to like 39 yards, which is impressive. And so I've seen a lot of people calling for that. And then last week they go back to Jerry Tillery and there's a lot of question marks there. Like, why is this, what does his coaching staff see in Jerry Tillery? Why are we being told that this staff plays better players, not based on draft stock or price tag, but based on who gives you a better shot to win? Now, I, have, I can't answer that yet because I was pretty surprised, too, that Jerry Taylor ended up getting all the snaps again. Forrest Merrill was a scratch. Foco got, like, not very many snaps at all. So I'll be curious to see what happens this week against the Bengals because Jerry Taylor did not have a good game against the Broncos. So we'll see what adjustments they make there on the defensive line because if you're able to slow down Joe Mixon, that allows your pass rush to get going, and that allows you to then not put so much pressure on this banged up secondary. That's kind of why I want to get to that. It's always this. And it's like that in any game. It's not just this Chargers team. It's like that with the Rams. And it's why the second most important position after quarterback is pass rush. It's why you see the top 10 picks in the draft and the offensive line is also up there. Top 10 picks, you usually see quarterbacks, edge rushers, and offensive tackles. Those you usually see in those top 10 picks. Every now and then you'll get a running back or a receiver. But those are usually your the majority of those top 10 picks. And there's a reason for that. Because if you can get after the quarterback, it makes his job really hard, and it makes the offense not very successful in general. So if you're able to establish the run and not allow a pass rush to get to you because you're running the football down their throats, and then it opens things up for when you do want to pass because the defense is expecting the run, and then you can scorch the secondary. So it is absolutely integral for this front seven. So that'll include Drew Tranquil. That'll include Kaiser White. That'll include Kyler Murray. Or, uh, yeah, Murray if he does play. Kenneth Murray, not Kyler Murray. <laughs> Kenneth Murray if he does get more snaps, which he would have like eight snaps last game. So obviously this defense runs better with Tranquil and Kaiser White. It'll be so important for them to slow down Joe Mixon because then it'll force Joe Burrow to have to drop back many, many times. And I'm not saying this is a great thing because of how much talent they have, but it allows Joey Bosa to get going, who I would expect. I'll end with this before moving on to UCLA to end the show. I was pretty tough on Joey Bosa on my last episode of the LA football show. The Broncos last week had one starter remaining on the offensive line. It was their center, Lloyd Kishenberry, second year player, fourth round pick last year. Wouldn't call him a star center, but he's their starter. He's improved. Going against Joey Bosa was a guy that was on the practice squad 48 hour prior to this game. Bosa did get one sack, but he was pretty non-existent most of the game. Got some pressure, got, got that one sack. But when you're going up with the talent of Bosa, with the work ethic and effort of Bosa, because it's not a it's not a lack of effort by any means. 
but you expect him to be able to blow up a game when you're going up against a practice squad tackle. I just didn't. So I was I was fairly critical. Usually I'm not very that critical on players. A, because they're a hell of a lot better than I am. <laughs> so I don't think it's that fair. But B, because I know what goes into it. And I and I can peel away the onion and say, okay, well, this is what they didn't do well, but this is what they did do well. But when you're going against that subpar talent and hats off to that kid in Denver who, you know, played first star game of his life against one of the NFL's best. But that being said, I would expect this week, Bosa's not going to forget that. I'm not saying he listened to me talk about it, but he knows that. I'm sure they watched the film. I'm not, I'm sure I know they watched the film. I'm going to say a three-stack game for Joey Bosa. I'm going to say a three-stack game for Joey Bosa. Huge rebound game. I need to look. I don't know what it is on my bookie, what his, uh, his prop is. I'm sure it's like a sack and a half. So I would take the over for sure. I think he's going to have a big game. Big game. Remind people why he's considered one of the best because statistically speaking this year, he hasn't been. And part of that is him also learning a new position, going from a 4-3 down backer to a 3-4 outside edge rusher. It doesn't sound like a huge transition, but it's it's different, and you do have different gap assignments, and there's still like the run game you have to think about. So we'll see. I expect a big game out of him. Last thing I'll say, and I want you guys to let me know. Comment below. If you're on radio, hit me up on Twitter at Ryan Dyer at LAFB. I really want to hear your thoughts on this. Let's get some interaction going. I'll post this on, uh, if you know, uh, the, the debate platform cited. I'll post it on that as well. But it'll be on the LA Football Network you can find. But comment below if you're on YouTube. Justin Herbert versus Joe Burrow. Matchup we're all excited for. If the draft was today, which one are you taking? Which one are you taking? Chargers fans, I know, 100% will say Justin Herbert, and rightfully so. He's our guy. He's been great. Had a few rough weeks this year. Did Had actually a really poor game last week again. He had about four now, where it's just like not good games. But still, he's the guy. And this isn't, you know, this isn't a, it's a fair question, because I think both, you can't go wrong with either one of these guys. Joe Burrow's been great too, outside of, you know, tearing his ACL last year. He would have, it would have been a tight, tight race for Rookie of the Year had he have stayed healthy between Justin Herbert and Joe Burrow. Would have been real tight. So, Chargers fans, I know you're going with Herbert, as you should. Personally, I would too. I think he gives you a little more. There's no injury history. You know, they're different style players, different personalities. Both are great. I'm sticking with Herbert. Herbert was my guy in the draft anyway. I would have taken him over Burrow at the time, personally. I also watched more Oregon football, so I kind of knew what he was capable of, but... He was my guy. I had him over to him. Um, But for those listening that are either Rams fans that are non-LA football fans, curious your thoughts. If you agree and you would go with Herbert or if you'd go Joe Burrow. So we'll put a poll up. Comment below if you're on YouTube. Like I said, if you're on radio, go to LAFBnetwork.com and we'll have something up there for you to vote on. Should be a great game, though. I do like the Chargers. Like I said, Dan Wolkenstein will be out there, one of our correspondents. Uh, for the game so we'll definitely have him on probably have him on live before the game so if you go to LAFP Network YouTube or just our website we'll do a little live show pre-game um, bright and early 10 a.m kickoff here but we'll have Dan on because he'll be at the stadium Paul Brown Stadium so should be a lot of fun all right let's wrap up the show the LA football show thank you all so much for tuning in brought to you by our friends at Golden Road Brewery phenomenal beer if you're a beer drinker gotta head to Golden Road we got Three locations, one in L.A., one in Anaheim, and one in Huntington Beach. Technically, Sunset Beach. Beautiful, sleepy town of Sunset Beach that I actually worked in for about six years during college. No, I did not take six years to graduate college, but I worked there during college and a little bit after. <laughs> so, yeah, there's a, a also a tap, uh, tap room there. So, Golden Ribbery, shout out to them. UCLA, they're kind of, they were the talk of the town a little bit because eight-win season. What's going to happen with Chip Kelly going bowling? Big win against Cal. It was at the game at the Rose Bowl. They looked dominant after the first quarter or so. But then Lincoln Riley comes to town, and UCLA kind of is forgotten again. We're not going to forget him here because we got a big bowl game, the first of the Chip Kelly era that this team is going to play him. Now, we talked uh, last show kind of what we thought. We thought it was going to be either the Holiday Bowl in San Diego. Many of our listeners on uh, – my or 1090 are in San Diego. So UCLA could be coming to you 
Uh, this year, I heard, is actually going to be played at Petco Park, which I think is going to be awesome. I think having a football game at Petco will be freaking sweet. Um, but we also said the Vegas Bowl are kind of the two. The three affiliates outside of the Rose Bowl are you know, the Vegas Bowl, the uh, Holiday Bowl, the Alamo Bowl, and then also the Sun Bowl. Those four are kind of the Pac-12 affiliates. And then now the LA Bowl, which is the sixth seed in the Pac-12. Um, but it, for based on standings, it was either going to be the Vegas Bowl or the Holiday Bowl. Now, the Athletic came out with their projections on bowls, which will be announced on Sunday. And they project the UCLA Bruins to play in the Holiday Bowl in San Diego at Petco Park, mashed up against Wake Forest. I think that'll be a great game. I'm still hoping that Clemson, so the Holiday Bowl is, is Pac-12 and ACC. That's that's the matchup. Wake Forest is the higher seed, so technically it'd be a more premier matchup in terms of seeding. But a name like Clemson, if UCLA can match up against Clemson, win or lose, as long as it's close, don't get blown out. But if it's a competitive game, that is great for this program. Nothing against Wake Forest. Because that will be a great game too. And they are a great team. I, I one lost team, I believe. So that'll be a solid game as well. But if you can beat Dabo Swinney and the Clemson Tigers out here in the West, there's a lot of luster about UCLA. They had now won four, five straight with that going into the season against a, a pretty easy non-conference schedule. It, USC's got a lot of excitement, but UCLA does too then. So I'm hoping for a Clemson matchup for this UCLA Bruins. We'll keep you posted. Make sure to go to the LAFB Network, lafbnetwork.com. We'll have updates as soon as that's announced on Sunday. That's going to do it for me. This is the LA Football Show. Thank you guys all for tuning in. Hope you have a great weekend. Chargers kickoff, 10 a.m. Rams kickoff, 105. Let's hope the best for our LA teams. I'm Ryan Dyer. Peace.